What is up, punks? It's Shinobi, and we are bringing you the 250th episode of Block Digest at block height 663,721, Wednesday, December 30th. What is crackalacking, Ginny? Woo! I have had a fun couple of days running around as a pixel person. Yes, I, I am angry that um, internet in the middle of nowhere sucked too hard for me to really do anything. Well, hopefully you will still be able to in an hour or two. Woo! But in, in, a, in a relation to the, the 250, do, do you realize that we are 100 episodes away from being able to make jokes about tree fitty? I did not think of that. I was thinking about how we're a quarter of the way to the uh, first all-time high Bitcoin price that people cared about. I don't know how I feel about the thought of still doing this that far in the future. <laughs> oh, come on. You don't think? Okay, so it took us three years to get to 250, which means it will take another nine years <laughs> to get to a thousand by that time i want to be in a mountain cabin with a starlink dish avoiding all human contact because people are stupid hey you never know we might uh we might join podcast 2.0 and just make passive income off of the shit <laughs> by then by then i'm not sure i'll care about that <laughs> Hopefully, hopefully. Uh, but yeah, 250. How old do you think we are, Vogue? <laughs> what, what, what the fuck do you mean I won't live as long as it would take to make a thousand episodes? Yeah, like wh what the fuck does that even mean? I am calculated and intelligent in my recklessness, so fuck you. All right, I am officially ignoring Vogue and ignoring the chat box. It won't, it won't be Bitcoin that kills you. It will be the, <laughs> the alcohol. Excuse me, I'm Irish. Um, it is literally impossible for that to have any negative effect on my health. It's genetics. If you say so. I don't think that's how that works. That is exactly how that works. It's called science. All right, but uh, our first story for the day, I guess, is the breaking news from the last episode. Yeah, so... Yeah. Uh, I'm assuming you actually listened to the uh, what Bitcoin did with uh, Pascal. So I, I actually haven't. <laughs> Because I've been doing so much other things. I have it on my to-do list, and I'm sure it's basically just an apology tour of some sort, but also not quite as much an apology tour in terms of fully admitting culpability. Because if, if you've been in contact with anyone who's actually been trying to get some shit done on, I don't know, getting at least their data removed, whatever good that will do now that it's been publicly released. Um, they're not responding to customer uh, support requests very much, or at least that hasn't been my experience with the people I've talked to. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how much an apology is worth when you're not putting the effort in. Yeah. 
I, I just listened to a few snippets and then was kind of watching the reaction on Twitter. And yeah, I, I kind of get the vibe. It was just a, we're sorry. We're so sorry. We're sorry. My my uh my favorite meme, uh, which is not was not posted in relation to Ledger, but there's a meme that I shared on my uh, during the chit chat of my financial cancel culture talk on the twenty first, um, where it says it's not a data breach, it's a se- it's a surprise backup. <laughs> Yeah, I mean it's Yeah, I mean this this is just it's this is fucked up. You know, like we we didn't really have much time to kind of dive into things or think about it cuz it literally happened while we were recording. But um yeah, this is like scary. Um you know, I I actually went and um got a copy of the breach and I was just kind of uh going through that and looking at addresses in Chicago. And um, wh- one hilarious that I'm a, Steve Wozniak is in there. Um, and I only found that by complete coincidence that he happened to be just below one of the Chicago addresses that I was flipping through. But uh, yeah, Steve Wozniak and his uh, address and all that's in there. But um, that's so yeah. cute. <laughs> but um, yeah, th- this is like, I, especially Ledger, but a lot of other people in the space, I, I keep seeing just repeating things like, you know, it, they're just going to try phishing attacks. Like all you have to worry about is phishing attacks. And like, that's just completely irresponsible, um, you know, a, a advice or, or a response to this. Like, obviously that's the first thing that's going to happen. And we've been seeing like the, the results of that all over the place in the last week. But like all, all these people saying like, don't worry about physical attacks. Like that's absurd. Like uh, half of the addresses that I was looking at in Chicago, um, they're, they're pretty much in the middle of the ghetto. So like really shit, dangerous areas, um, areas where people are not going to think twice about kicking your door in and putting a gun to your face. Um, so it's like, yeah, you, you have to really think about, um, you know, not everybody lives in a, a cozy suburb. Um, n- not everybody has cops driving down the street like every half hour or something or, or just a minute away. That, that's not the world for everybody. And then, you know, even for people in that situation, I mean, I I could just troll through this address and just start looking at property values in different areas. And I could decide, okay, I'm going to just go there to try and physically rob people because the odds are higher that they're going to have something that makes it worth breaking into somebody's house and taking that risk. Like, you know, this, this is like really fucked up. And it's not just don't give your seeds to somebody, um, you know, watch out for fishing. Like th- this list is just out there now and it's going to keep circulating. And I'm sure like the, the more the price goes up, the more people are going to become aware of that list circulating around until you have a lower and lower denominator of idiots um, grabbing that list because, hey, we can try and get some money here. Yeah, I have not, um, I haven't really looked through the list myself yet to see if there was anything particularly interesting, but what I did find as a hilarious side note, I don't know if this is from the list of people that had order information or just the newsletter subscription one, which I'll give a little summary of exactly what happened because maybe some people aren't aware yet, Um, but so Twitter actually, because Twitter's been, been doing this thing lately where it promotes tweets that fit under a particular topic and then they encourage you to follow that topic. And Twitter promoted a tweet to me from uh, Gigi. I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he's Dare Gigi on uh, Twitter, D-E-R-G-I-G-I. Um, and he had made a tweet saying, shout out to the guy from Down Under who purchased a ledger using vagina.destroy at gmail.com. <laughs> 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 but 
but I just found it. And, and so Twitter promoted this to me under funny tweets, like Twitter. <laughs> this is like the first time that Twitter has shared my sense of humor. <laughs> I was so surprised when I saw that. I was like, what is that doing here? <laughs> Why are they promoting it to me? Um, yeah. Isn't that technically um, them promoting um, personal information that resulted yeah. from a hack, which is directly against their terms of Oops. service? Yeah. What What the hell, Twitter? You're promoting, you're promoting hacked information now. What's up with that? Um, but yeah, Australians apparently... Uh, that's for anyone who doesn't know what down under refers to that's Australia. Um, but yeah, for anyone who hasn't heard, um, back in, I think it was June, June or July. That was when ledger claimed to have discovered their, the data breach of their e-commerce and marketing database. Um, and then they asserted that it quote, mostly consisted of email addresses, but with a subset, including also contact and order details, such as first and last name, postal address, email address, and phone number. And um, like I said, we briefly covered this as breaking news in the middle of the last episode um, on December 20th. Uh, it's not known whether the person who posted it obtained it firsthand or secondhand, as far as I know, but a hacker um, has since dumped over 1 million email addresses and 272,000 shipping orders. So, like, Ledger making the claim that it was a small subset, it's like, y yes, it is a it is a subset. It is, uh, you know, a court... Oh, one second. Cat is doing bad things. Bad kitty. Get out of the trash can. Okay, I'm back. Anyway, um, yeah, so... Technically, Ledger wasn't completely lying by saying that the more detailed personal information that got leaked was a subset because uh, 272,000 is uh, smaller than 1 million. But um, Jesus Christ, Ledger, uh, that, that is not a small amount of people. Um, so the fact that they kind of, uh, I mean, they they kind of, I guess, are telling people that they weren't aware of the scale of it, like they, that this is a lot more than they thought had been exposed. Um, in that case, holy crap, your forensic process must be awful if there's that big of a gap. Because I believe that the, the original number of postal and order information that they thought had been leaked was somewhere between like 2,000 and 9,000 or something. Do you remember what it was? Um, not off the top of my head. I'm pretty sure it was less than, I think 9,000 was the email addresses and like 2,000 or 100. It was like, it was a very small amount. So 270,000 compared to a couple thousand, let's say, is a big difference. Like, so anyway, yeah, 272,000 shipping orders on, uh, it was published on raid forums and, uh, you know, everyone's passing it around now, so... There's an archive of the page where it was posted. It doesn't actually show the information. It just has the links to it. Um, but there's other places you can... If you think you've been impacted, you can... I would recommend going to Have I Been Pawned. Although that might not be the best option because they... Basically, if you input your email address, they'll tell you whether you're, you're included in the data breach. They don't tell you if it was just your email address or also the other things that are way more concerning. Um, so you might have to look at another source like IntelX or something, um, which other people shared so you can find that easily. Um, but yeah, Ledger on the same day, they kind of tentatively confirmed that this was real customer information at first when we were, when I was talking about it in the last show, I wasn't sure, but they've since confirmed that, um, it is. And they claimed that they've, since the breach, uh, they've hired a new chief information security officer, which I haven't checked who their previous one was. Uh, hopefully they had one before, <laughs> which uh, seemed to be the thing with when the BlockFi data breach happened. Uh, it was like there was no, no indication that they even had an information security officer, as far as I could tell. 
Um, and then they also say they thoroughly reviewed our data policy, executed penetration tests and forensic analysis with external security firms and are, well, by the way, you should probably hire a different one now because the one that you hired before was clearly not as up to scratch uh, in being able to figure out what got leaked. Um, and continuously, yeah, continuously working with law enforcement to prosecute hackers and stop these scammers. Um, because, yeah, the phishing stuff keeps going on. Um, oh, that was the sound of the cat. <laughs> <laughs> that was the sound of the cat being naughty. <laughs> One second. That cat is a little demon child today. Okay, I'm back again. Um, yeah, so uh, the CEO... As far as I could tell, he there was like a separate post besides the interview that he did on what Bitcoin did where he acknowledged that people were being personally threatened and kind of they gave advice about what to do. But to be honest, it didn't really go far enough if your threat model is, you know, the entire internet knows where I live now and knows that I could have Bitcoin or some other cryptocurrency that Ledger supports. And I'll read two of the reports that I saw on Twitter from people. So the first one, I think this was tweeted out by um, CA Crypto Lawyer um, from someone on Reddit saying that they received a th phone call threatening kidnapping and murder. And would, by the way, like, you know, obviously these are just anonymous people posting experiences on Reddit. They, who knows if they're real, who knows if the person threatening them is actually planning to do anything. Um, but the point is that this is stuff that could happen to anyone and there, it's going to happen to someone. Like, you, there's no way that in a, you, you get a leak of 270,000 people and according to the person who posted it on raid forums, they say it was selling for six Bitcoin, which depending on what time frame you're in, that's at least $100,000. Um, so yeah, um, there are, <laughs> there are people who want to know what is on this list. Um, there seems to be enough interest, so it's going to affect someone. And this is probably like, it's scary enough if, even if you don't execute it, there's going to be people who are just going to want to troll people on this list and send them threatening phone calls, even if they don't plan to do anything. And so you should be aware of the kind of things that you might get if you got included in this breach. Um, so he says that uh, a male Anglo-Saxon, uh, or male Anglo-accent caller asked if I was, insert full name, <clears throat> and claimed to be a drug addict and gave my full address and said he knows I have a lot of bitcoins. When asked how, he said my information has been leaked on the dark web. I played dumb and he eventually says I purchased a ledger hardware wallet and only loaded cunts by them. He told me a sob, and that's also the thing. So the leak, the data breach, none of that included anything to do with Bitcoin addresses. There's absolutely no private key information, nothing. There's nothing to say how much Bitcoin you have. And um, also to make a minor correction, because I'd predicted like that <clears throat> the hacker might, or anyone who sees this uh, data breach might go back to, for example, 2017. Um, and see who bought around that time period as like a good indicator of who might, you know, not, uh, who might be not up to scratch in terms of, you know, they bought into hype and maybe they're not paying attention as much and might be of greater risk of this kind of thing. Um, I, I haven't checked my, Shinobi, did you check the dates on the orders? Because I, as far as I heard, it only goes back to sometime in 2018. Um, th there's not explicit, um, dates in what I have. Um, if there's any kind of temporal ordering to that, that's just the order that the data files in. Yeah. So I'm think, I think it was Jameson Lop who said it goes back to 2018. I'm not sure how he knew that. I have, I would have to look at the list myself. I, I barely looked at it. Um, but yeah, so whatever the time frame is, um, that could still happen. Um, and so even though the data breach didn't include any information about like how much Bitcoin you have, the assumption that a lot of, you know, 
wrench holders, shall we call them, are going to have is that if you have Bitcoins, you're rich. Because that's what they see in the news all the time is about the price going up. So they assume that anyone who has one of these devices probably has Bitcoins and probably has a lot of money. Even if that may not be true, you may have a very small amount because you can't afford to do more than that. Um, the problem is you get lumped in with this kind of straw man of a person that these people think you are. Um, so the rest of the thing says he told me a sob story about how he's addicted to meth, is about to run out, and needs to buy, uh, needs Monero to buy more. He demanded ten Monero and said if it's not sent by midnight, he will show up at my house, kidnap me, and stab to death any relatives living at my address. I was able to record this phone call as I put him on speakerphone. I have went to the police and filed a police report. They're going to try and trace the caller and have sent a police car to wait outside, which I am very grateful for. All of my doors are locked and I have a f uh, officer's phone on speed dial. Yep. See, th this is why whenever... Whether that's the device itself or just having a gun or a means to defend yourself. Because... Like, if if you are not incorporating physical threats into your threat model, you are not thinking ahead enough. And this, like, this event just completely makes my point. Like, all of these people, almost none of them probably ever actually thought about that in terms of something they have to defend against. And now they're just getting slapped in the face with the visceral reality, yes, you do. Yeah, and there's another one. This was actually posted on, well, I'm not sure if the last, I can't remember where the last one was posted, but this one was posted on the Ledger Wallet subreddit. And it says, um, below is an email I received today. No, I'm not worried, but seriously, fuck you, Ledger. I now get three to four emails a day and five to six text messages a day go to hell. Um, and there, the sample message they provide is, hello, insert my name. I have recently become aware of your cryptocurrency holdings. I also live in, insert my city. And I also know that you live at, insert my address. I'm not afraid to invade your home. I don't want to make this harder than it has to be. I'm offering you $500, shouldn't considering the recent to leave you alone. If not, I'm afraid, I'm not afraid to show up when you least expect it and see how, how my wrench works against your face. Uh, or maybe even wait for you to leave your home and take your belongings whilst you're not there to call the police. I'll be waiting for the money and watching you until then. So that's the other thing is that, like, even if someone doesn't come and attack you directly, they may just, you know, they 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 may just stake out where you live. Like maybe maybe enough information wasn't. Uh, published in there for them to know like which which apartment or which room you're in at that address but they if if they're motivated enough they could just show up and surveil you and fig you know for other reasons mm -hmm. and he here's another big thing to consider um and i apologize to the vast majority of bitcoin plebs who are motivated to learn and otherwise intelligent people but some of you are absolute retards. Like um, this person I will not name directly, who when I pointed this out, um, started shrieking about how I'm a government shill um, and should go work for the IRS. But um, here's a really big thing to consider with this leak, because I think uh, a little more than a third of these addresses are all in the United States. The IRS now has a gigantic list of the names and addresses and phone numbers of United yeah. States citizens who bought a ledger. And guess what? If you didn't check that little checkbox that you handled crypto last year, you get an audit. I guarantee you that is going to be a big data mining event and they're going to go through this and they are going to dig up everybody's tax returns on this list and they are going to see who did not check that checkbox and they are going to go audit. Yep. So, yeah. Um, if your name is on this list and you have not been filing your taxes for things properly, um, that is something you should consider right now because there's still all the prior stuff you can get poked for um if you did that wrong and
tax season is coming up in four months. So yeah, that is something that is absolutely important to consider because this is just out there right now. And hey, all of these government regulators, all of these chain analysis companies, all, all, all the entities in this space who engage in, in those kinds of attempts to force compliance, they hoover all this shit up. So that is very important to consider if you were on this list. Mm-hmm. Alrighty. But besides that clusterfuck, what's next? Well, another clusterfuck, potentially, although nowhere near as big as Ledger's. Um, so, COBOL Wallet, um, the Android-based hardware wallet, has implemented a new firmware feature that allows users generating a new word seed <clears throat> to manually pick their words and generate the 24th word, which is a checksum for them. Now, in a charitable case, um, this could be useful. If you had a canonical, um, you know, um, mnemonic dictionary, the 11 binary bits that it mapped to, that you could verify the authenticity of, and then, um, yeah, just do something like flip a coin and manually look those words up and punch them in yourself so that you know that the entropy is solid. Like what you actually flipped is the actual words going into and um, generating keys. But um, I think that we can all acknowledge that a lot of people in this space have no clue what they're doing or how to handle things themselves properly. And um, this just opens the door to users manually picking word seeds without using secure entropy, just picking things manually themselves. And um, to make matters worse, um, the demo video that they released was literally somebody just putting the same word in over and over and over again 23 times. So the demonstration video is literally just reinforcing the idiotic way to use this feature, which is just manually pick things with no coins or dice or entropy involved, which is the epitome of stupidity. Then the link um, that was kind of framed as more information about that feature um, just links to setting up a multi-sig with a cold card tutorial. Um, so yeah, like what the holy fuck? Um, there, there is a solid reason to have something like this, but that comes with a lot of crystal clear um, procedures being conveyed to a user to do that securely and also requires trusting some source for users to go to to get a copy of that mnemonic dictionary to manually verify without funny games going on there. And the fucking demo video is just the same word over and over again. The thing that's supposed to clarify that feature links to some tutorial that has nothing to do with that feature and th there is no actual clear explanation of how to handle entropy generation securely um, instead of just picking words that you like um, which is beyond idiotic because people suck at randomness so th th this is kind of just like what the fuck yep you know, like, I, I, I just keep thinking w when I see dumb shit like this happen, one day there is going to be just issues like this exploited all over the place and somebody is going to pull up the old time-traveling Citadel Reddit post and point at the part where all the smartphones got hacked and a bunch of people got fucked and they're going to be like, some troll on Reddit saw this coming the potential for this um if things were not designed and managed and used properly 
Um, why the fuck didn't the people designing and building these things see this this potential problem? Mm -hmm. So, like, yeah, um, th there is a sound reason to do this, but there are other threats and weak points in using it like that that need to be addressed. And then, holy shit, you don't show users this idea with a video of somebody picking the same word over and over again with with no kind of coin or dice or any type of entropy just somebody picking things all right ready for some cool news yes so Unchain Capital finally rolled out um, PSBT and cold card support with their Caravan web wallet. Um, very nice, simple um, setup. You can just pull the XPUB off the cold card um, when you're setting up the multi-sig wallet and import all the required XPUBs. Um, export your multi-sig file which is the config with all the involved xpubs and information needed to um, actually spend from that in the future um, and then caravan now also generates a cold card um, config file for you to um, export and then import into the cold card because the device actually requires having all the XPUBs involved in a wallet to verify things before signing multisig. So you can just pop that into uh, all the cold cards involved and get that set up. And then everything is as simple as exporting the PSBT from Caravan, passing it around and signing it, and you have yourself a valid transaction. So this nice. is just... This is just super neato in the sense of being able to safely pass around all the necessary spending information. Um, just having a stateless coordination thing that can be pulled up anywhere in the world and sign away with a secure device to your heart's content. And potentially you could even do... Um, you know, interesting things like if you have privacy concerns, um, there's no reason in theory why you couldn't encrypt any of the, the files um, or configs for Caravan with XPUB information to individual private keys that uh, participants in the multisig have. So you could even potentially um, store things in the cloud and pass that around that way with um, everything encrypted so there's no privacy leak concerns there. Cool. Woohoo! Alrighty. Try tried to get the max woohoo out of that because I think there's three stupid things in a row again. What do the unstables have to say? <sighs> yeah. So, um, a working group under the uh, president on financial markets um, is going after stable coins systematically. Um, <laughs> so really the, the two big issues here on their minds are um, market stability and then obviously AML KYC shit. So yeah. <laughs> Um, they, they pretty much want all stablecoin um, arrangements, as they're calling, which involve anything from the issuer, operator, custodian of uh, reserves, market makers, um, to consider financial stability. Um, pretty much requiring, um, you know, the reserve requirements one-to-one -one that are redeemable, um, as well as in the case of USD backed stable coins, um, hold specific high quality um, US denominated assets, um, require they be held in US regulated entities and require um, pretty much multiple custodians. Um, so things have to be split up in terms of reserves. Um, beyond that, they want end user protection requirements. Um, 
which pretty much require the entire arrangement of issuance, um, reserve holding, and redeeming to be set up in a way um, where everything can pretty much be cashed out and redeemed in a timely way, um, specifically um, set up so that the entity handling all of that has to be liquid enough to not only do that, but cover any kind of slippages or shortfalls or losses um, that result from any kind of disruptive stampede um, <laughs> to redeem everything. Um, as well as have clear um, error resolution or um, dispute arbitration mechanisms there. Um, moving on, they also require um, AML um, counterterrorism um, compliance. Um, and all of this um, is required to be set up and operational before bringing any products to market. Um, they must maintain compliance to the same degree as traditional institutions, as well as regularly assess and um, change things as needed based on the changing environment of stable coins. Um, this includes um, risk management, um, verifying customers, um, you know, tracking transactional histories and using all of this to rate risk. Um, including anything involving unhosted air quote um, wallets. So this pretty much is asking even self-custodied on-chain stable coins um, to be KYC'd so that the issuers can track things. Um, as well, um, they are requiring um, lots and lots of data collection and the security infrastructure um, that is adequate and scalable enough um, to maintain and secure this information, as well as um, transmit that between different jurisdictions, supply that to um, foreign jurisdictions where people or entities may be involved in handling this um, stablecoin asset. Um, yeah, so that one's real fun. Um, and as well, um, nothing may undermine um, confidence in and the stability of domestic fiat currencies. Um, the U.S. would require additional limitations on any stable coin that is not exchangeable for the underlying fiat currency, one-to-one um, -one ignoring fees or for which the um, value is determined by referencing more than one fiat currency. So that would pretty much be things like Libra or um, the so-called ag algorithmic stable coins um, that don't have um, you know, redeemable fiat on Ethereum and shit. Um, yeah, so pretty much um, regardless of whether it is um, centralized and custodial, um, whether it's happening on a decentralized chain with people self-custodying, um, they want to completely wrap all stablecoin shit um, under the umbrella of traditional financial regulations and start treating them like payment processors and banks. In other words, they want to kill um, the tool that has allowed global markets to arbitrage efficiently and let marketplaces that have trouble getting access to banking services um, and kill it so that, you know, they're kind of the middleman you have to go through to interact with things like that. Um, which would really, if things play out this way, um, completely change the global landscape of Bitcoin and crypto markets. Um, it would kind of be going back to the days before Tether where you just eat shit and you deal with um, whatever you have to deal with to move fiat around between marketplaces. Fun. Yep. And, you know, I, I really want to drive home the point that this is not just some kind of willy-nilly lash out at things like this is a pretty big kick in the dick to the ability for Bitcoin markets to function in a way where 
legacy controls can't just clamp down like they can on legacy markets. Like stable coins, Tether in particular, were a massive part of that. Where while all of these marketplaces were getting shut out of the banking system, um, and in my mind, so that traditional um, institutions could kind of come in and corner these markets, out popped Tether and um, they were unable to just push these crypto businesses um, out of existence just by cutting them off from the banking markets anymore. So this is kind of a stab at the thing that enabled that. And that would have, if this passes, a corresponding major shift in how markets here work. So yeah, um, fuck this presidential working group. Did it. So what are some other morons up to? Well, on December 17th, uh, the IMF published a blog post titled What Really New in Fintech? And there is a subheader called New Types of Information. Oh, there's the cat being naughty again. One second. Devil cat! All right. Yeah, so... There's a subheader called New Types of Information, and it says the most transformative information innovation increase in the use of new types of data coming from the digital footprint of customers' various online activities, mainly for creditworthiness analysis. Credit scoring using so-called hard information, income, employment time, assets, and debts, is nothing new. Typically, the more data is available, the more accurate is the assessment. But this method has two problems. First, hard information tends to be pro-cyclical. It boosts credit expansion in good times, but exacerbates contraction during downturns. The second and most complex problem is that certain kinds of people, like new entrepreneurs, innovators, and many informal workers, might not have enough hard data available. Even a well-paid expatriate moving to the United States can be caught in the conundrum of not getting a credit card for lack of credit record and not having a credit record for lack of credit cards. Fintech resolves the dilemma by tapping various non-financial data. The type of browser and hardware used to access the internet, the history of online searches and purchases. Recent research documents that, once powered by artificial intelligence and machine learning, these alternative data sources are often superior than traditional credit assessment methods and can advance financial inclusion for, by example, enabling more credit to informal workers in households and firms in rural areas. Yeah. That's not terrifyingly dystopian at all. And so this is based on, uh, it's attached uh, to a working research paper that they published back in August of the year. And it looks like the same people who wrote the blog post also wrote the research paper, which is titled Financial Intermediation and Technology, What's Old, What's New?, which states, the use of non-financial data will have large effects on the provision of financial services. Traditionally, banks rely on the analysis of customer financial information from payment flows and accounting records. The rise of the internet permits the use of new types of non-financial customer data, such as browsing histories and online shopping behavior of individuals, or customer ratings for online vendors. The literature suggests that such non-financial data are valuable for financial decision-making. Berg et al. Uh, 2019 show that easy-to-collect information such as the so-called digital footprint, email provider, mobile carrier, operating system, etc., uh, performs as well as traditional credit scores in assessing brow uh, borrower risk. Moreover, there are complementaries, uh, compl complementarities, okay, between what? financial and non-financial data, combining credit scores and the digital footprint further improves loan default predictions. Accordingly, the incorporation of non-financial data can lead to significant efficiency gains in financial intermediation. Large technology firms collect vast amounts of non-financial data through their consumer-facing platforms in the areas of e-commerce, social networking, and online search. The sheer amount of data enables the use of big data analysis tools such as artificial intelligence and machine learning. The liter literature confirms their usefulness in finance. Yeah, so um, if anyone thinks that we're not on the way to a Chinese-type social credit score system, um, yeah, this is, this is the IMF basically recommending that. 
Of course, disclaimer, this is a working paper and it does not necessarily rep represent the views of the IMF, but you know how that goes. All I can think right now is the dancing Boston Dynamic robots and the hellish AI deep learning powered nightmare that is quickly barreling towards us. Yeah, well, uh, speaking of the uh, RC3 conference, uh, one of the talks is about how AI is stupid, so hopefully AI or artificial intelligence remains artificially unintelligent for long enough for us to escape this shit. Nope. That kind of thinking completely misses the point. Um, AI is just the efficient way to scan and enforce things for people on top. And if you can sell the plebs on the idea that it's some smart sci-fi AI thing, great. If not, they don't care. I mean, all I'm seeing from that space is like, there was another story, I think in the New York Times, I don't know, but um, there was another story about a guy who was profiled as being a i think a thief or something he or he had salt he had he had stolen something and assaulted an officer and he was imprisoned on that basis that he some facial recognition thing misidentified him because guess what apparently a lot of this stuff doesn't work on people with dark skin who knew yeah i don't think that's gonna stop um the powers that be from deploying these things anyway but, like, all of this just, I mean, I mean, it just, it boggles my mind how fucked up the entire credit scoring system is. Like, I've never even had a credit card, so I don't have a credit score. And, like, I learned a long time ago that, like, apparently not having a credit score, as in not having a history of going into any kind of debt, is, like, bad. <laughs> Which is so bizarre. Like you'd think you'd think that having a person come up to you and say, Hey, guess what? I've managed to live my entire life without having to go into debt or I've paid off my debts informally and I have I I did you know, I've never had to ask a bank for money. Like, am I not a great sounding customer? Apparently not. Nope. Nope. They want you to be in debt so that you pay the interest and they make your money off of your money and you stay a slave in the system that's right. the whole game oh, man. yeah that is absolutely just terrifying and improvements in software and hardware uh privacy wise cannot come soon enough mm-hmm all righty what are the bots doing our favorite bots. Woo! So, this lawsuit against Ripple. Wow. Um, I have absolutely no idea um, how the holy hell um, that Ripple thought they could get away with this. Um, so the defendants in the case are Ripple, the company, um, Garlinghouse, the current CEO, and Larson, the um, former CEO. Now, very simple stuff. Um, in the buildup, they point out um, three things. The unique node list, um, which is involved in the consensus mechanism because in Ripple, everybody just pretty much makes their own transactions, push around, and um, if all the nodes on their list are in agreement, it moves forward. Um, it's kind of just voting, but everybody gets to pick their own list. The problem with that, um, you know, one, one second while I take a drink. Now, the, the big problem with that is if everybody picks their own list and that list doesn't overlap and there's disagreement, um, everything breaks. Or in, in the uh, case of their safety feature kicking in, um, stalls. So Ripple themselves publish a list that everybody should use. 
they go on to point out 40% of nodes are operated by United States entities. And then the fact that all 100 billion XRP were printed out of thin air with 80 billion going to Ripple Labs, um, 9 billion going to Jed McCaleb, the co-founder, um, 9 million going to Larson, the original CEO, and 2 million, I believe, going, or, I'm sorry, billions, not millions, um, going to Ripple Agent number one, um, who I believe is uh, Joel Katz, although he's unnamed in the document, so not for sure. Um, yeah. They then go on to mention the fact that two different international law firms um, provided Ripple with legal memos um, that there was risk XRP would be considered an investment contract and thus a security under security laws based on various factors, including how Ripple promoted and marketed XRP to potential purchasers, the motivation of such purchasers, and Ripple's other activities with regards to XRP. If individuals purchased XRP to engage in speculative investment trading, or if Ripple's employees promoted XRP as potentially increasing in price, the legal memos warned that Ripple would face an increased risk that XRP would be considered investment contracts and thus securities. They also warned that it was highly unlikely Ripple would ever be considered a currency under U.S. law. Woo! Yeah. Now we're not even getting into the fun parts. Um, pretty much all of the um, XRP sales um, from Ripple to other entities um, were directly authorized by both Larson and Garlinghouse under their time as CEO. Um, Initially, they were just selling XRP themselves to individual investors and eventually shifted because of a slap um, to dumping them to traders and market makers to sell to investors. Um, they literally paid all of these entities commission in XRP. Now, here's where it gets mind-bogglingly holy shit. Um, all of these entities in being um, you know, granted XRP, were limited with the rate that they could sell XRP in the market to a specific percentage basis points of market volume specifically to not drive the price down. When XRP was sold then to institutional entities such as investment funds, um, brokers, hedge funds. Um, they gave the same restrictions in terms of how much these entities were allowed to dump based on market volume to not suppress the price. A lot of these institutions also had um, a restriction of three to 12 months where they could not sell at all until that elapsed. Um, now, three entities are named here, a, um, well, not named, um, inferred to under pseudonyms. Um, Institution A, which was a New York hedge fund, which acquired 14.8 million XRP. Institution B, a prime broker in California, which acquired 115 million XRP, and a Japanese entity, Institution C, which I believe is SBI, um, acquired 1.1 billion XRP. SBI has recently been making public statements that um, XRP is not a security under um, US securities laws and been trying to defend their use and integration of Ripple, and um, I'm assuming also flipping out about the massive bags that they have. I do believe, if I remember the numbers correctly, they put a quarter of a billion dollars into acquiring that 1.1 billion Ripple. Now, Ouch. moving on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but um, 
Next is the um, on-demand liquidity product, which was Ripple's um, SWIFT replacement program. Um, all of the companies involved in this um, were given at least um, in net 324 million XRP to subsidize the fees um, for plugging into and using ODL for sediment. Almost all of these entities involved literally sold all the XRP they were given the day they received it in order to secure cash to subsidize fees for using this program that was not profitable. <laughs> Next, um, Xpring and Ripple Works, two derivative spinoffs from X or Ripple Labs, um, were effectively just fronts um, to be gifted Ripple um, or XRP from Ripple Labs and sell it. So these are just two spin-off companies that were effectively there to generate hype and dump more XRP that they printed out of thin air. Here's the fun part. Um, yeah. Um, the entire time-locked escrow, that whole thing, was literally documented as being created explicitly to pump the price of Ripple by removing fears of it being dumped on the market. They also sold options to different hedge funds or institutional entities. Um, they outright paid exchanges in XRP <laughs> in order to list Ripple in the first place. Um, yeah. Pr pretty much the entire structure of this thing is they literally just printed money out of thin air, started dumping it on retail consumers, and then started distributing it to market makers and hedge funds and large traders with restrictions on how fast they could sell it to retail so that it didn't crash the price and chase away retail investors. This like, if this is not a Ponzi scheme, what the fuck is? Yeah, I mean, the closest I've ever gotten to any of these people outside of, obviously, the the shill bots on Twitter is I was at a conference last year. Uh, I think so, yeah. I was at a conference last year, and David Schwartz was giving a talk, and I, first of all, I was just like, seriously, oh my god, this guy is on stage in a big conference. And the talk was just terrible. He said all kinds of garbage. Um, that's about as close as I've ever gotten. <laughs> I was in the audience of David Schwartz's talk, and I was like, these people are insane. Mm-hmm. And so um, the SEC is pretty much seeking um, banning uh, permanently all defendants um, or any employee, servant, um, attorney, blah, 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 um, from ever um, delivering to another person or selling um, XRP again, um, looking for the disgorgement of all gains um, within the statute of limitations for everything they've made in profit from selling this. Um, prohibit defendants permanently from any offering of digital um, asset securities ever, uh, as well as um, demanding uh, civil penalties for this. So, yeah. Um, unless the SEC does not get a slam dunk here, um, they're screwed. Um, Garlinghouse, um, Larson, and Ripple Labs are all bankrupt, and Ripple is dead. Yeah, um, I think it was. I think it was Vladimir Vandalon who said, you know, Ripple is. Uh, the fact that this is happening to Ripple is proof that decentralization matters. Because if an if an SEC filing uh, kills your network, uh, or your network can be bought or whatever, um, it's not decentralized. And this is why we Bitcoin. Yeah. And then 
follow-up news from that. Um, uh, Bitstamp has halted um, XRP deposits and trades for U.S. customers. Um, Coinbase has shifted the entire XRP order book to limit orders only, so nobody can just market um, dump through the order books. You have to set a price, and somebody has to choose to match that price. Um, as well, um, this just happened today. Um, somebody is um, proposing a class action lawsuit. Um, I believe this would be their fourth um, for not knowing that XRP was probably a security before the SEC lawsuit and um, selling XRP to people. <laughs> Whoops. So yeah, that will, that will be a very interesting thing to see develop because if that actually um, is filed, goes through, yada yada, um, I really think that is going to make any exchange that can be touched by U.S. jurisdiction um, really think hard about what they want to list and sell to their customers. I mean, we tried to warn everybody, didn't we? Pretty, pretty sure Bitcoiners have uh, been shouting from the mountaintops about this one for years and years. Yeah, now I'm going to have to go around and check to see if any of the, uh, you know, f fun fintech apps have dropped it yet. I know I've seen a few uh, hedge funds um, completely drop and liquidate their holdings. Yeah, but the interesting part will be how fast the the ones offering it to retail customers have gotten out, because I know at least one app that literally you sign up for it and you have the option to buy a whole bunch of shit coins in addition to Bitcoin from the app, so... And it's not even it's not even a crypto focused app, it's just something that they offer, you know, as a other feature. And I wonder if they'll get rid of it. If they are subject to US jurisdiction, then I bet they will real quick. Well, I mean, I think even beyond the US, I mean, there's going to be other countries that are going to now look at it more closely and a bunch of businesses outside of the US might follow suit anticipating, especially like European businesses will probably do something similar. Well, I mean, we'll see, but I bet anything outside of US jurisdiction is probably just going to limit US customer access. Because um, yeah, um, you, you kind of want the door open for customers you have that it's legal for them to do this to kind of be able to get out so they don't get pissed at you. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. But what's some good news on the real monetary sovereignty front front? So this is actually a really cool Oh project. yeah, wait, um, wait. We gotta say fuck you, Ben Losky. We almost forgot. Oh yeah! Fuck you, Ben Losky, you fucking cocksucker. Thanks for creating Crypto Azkaban, otherwise known as New York City. Or New York in general. <laughs> Seriously, but don't I'm... ever live in New York. If you're in New York, you should just leave. Unless you're Kurt Russell. Kurt Russell lives in New York? Escape from New York, come on. All right. I don't. I'm not familiar with that. You movie. need like a list of of good movies to watch because you you haven't seen them yet. Hey, dude, there's a there's a Johnny Mnemonic anniversary coming up, January sixteenth or eighteenth or something, twenty twenty. Check the movie. My thumb is literally on the DVD case of my copy of that. Yeah. All right, all right, though. Um, yeah. So this is actually a really cool project uh, from Start9 Labs. And um, they recently, I think, went on Tales from the Crypt and also did a while back an episode with Stefan Levera. But I kind of haven't been tinkering with this or really looking at this too hard because initially um, 
it was kind of a buy the pre-built device for a premium. And as much as I appreciate that niche of products for non-technical people, I don't like tinkering with pre-bought things myself. I like to actually put it together with my own hands. But um, yeah, they, they have this uh, project, Embassy OS, um, which is designed to run on a Raspberry Pi. And it's pretty much just a little headless um, server box on a Pi that has a bunch of Bitcoin services um, running over Tor that you can connect to over Tor browser. Um, it can run a Bitcoin node, a proxy for the RPC, um, LND and C Lightning, as well as uh, Ride the Lightning, which is kind of a web-based um, console or dashboard for managing a lightning node and spark wallet um, which you can hook up to the node running on this but aside from the bitcoin related services um, they also have an instance of bitwarden a password manager running um, cups um, which is kind of a remote um, printer service so if you were able to access your server remotely and wanted to print something that server can um, deliver the print job to any actual printer you have hooked up to that i'm assuming both um, on the local network and remotely uh, a file browser for that as well as um, a app called burn after reading which is pretty much an ephemeral um, Tor-based messaging service um, that is run entirely in memory um, and not kept around persistently. So aside from the uh, crypto services here, you can remotely store files and access that seamlessly, um, even printer services, um, keep your, your password manager set up on your own infrastructure, but still have the convenience of being able to access it from the cloud, so to say, and this nice non-persistent um, private messaging service. Um, but the the real cool thing is that they have a DIY guide to set this up and build with your own Raspberry Pi now. Um, so given that it's not a pre-built device anymore, I think over the weekend, I'm going to tinker around with this just because, uh, yeah. Depending on how burn after reading works, I think this could be a nice um, coordination mechanism for the show to replace our current one. Mm -hmm. Yes. But yeah, was, was kind of hesitant to uh, really talk about this on the show because I don't want to just be pointing people at the product only. Um, but, you know... Whatever you want now, you can spend the time and effort to put one together yourself with your own pie, or if you are incapable or just don't want to, I guess you can uh, purchase the actual device from them. But this looks like a, a neat little thing for Bitcoiners to start playing with and considering. Um, and I'm especially interested um, what other kinds of non-Bitcoin services they might bundle into this over time. Yep. Alrighty, what do we got going on next? Well, I have previously uh, and actually contributed to the paper behind the cross-chain atomic swap client and protocol between Bitcoin and Monero. I did a spell check, very minor change, but um, Joel Gugger goes by hashed um, H4SH. 3D on Reddit and GitHub and stuff. Um, he initially wrote a paper about it, and then they've been working on a client and protocol since like a month or two or so. Um, the project has now been codenamed Farcaster, and he published an update on Reddit on I think it was Christmas Eve um, that uh, you know where the project was, what was happening, and resources and things and he said that a so-called bitcoin genie uh some anonymous person had encouraged them to work on using taproot outputs and schnorr signatures instead of ecdsa because uh by their prediction um they think that the schnorr taproot soft fork will happen in q4 2021 
so a, a, a year or less from now. Um, so that is interesting that that prediction uh, influenced their decision as well. But he says that they that's basically what they're doing. Um, and obviously using Schnorr signatures will improve privacy on the Bitcoin side. And so it'll improve the privacy of the atomic swap as a whole. Um, he says, uh, in the most common swap outcome, the successful case, no script nor the existence of a script hidden behind that pub key will ever be revealed to the Bitcoin blockchain and makes Bitcoin transactions cheaper. Beat that. Um, and then talks about Schnorr adapter signatures and then a bunch of other things they're doing. Um, but yeah, you can follow the project if you're curious at github.com slash farcaster dash project. Yeah, this is actually something I'm really interested to see deploy for a number of reasons. Just like one, obviously, um, everybody has kind of been slowly delisting um, Anon coins because bad. Um so that kind of starts introducing a big problem of moving from something um, more liquid like Bitcoin into Monero um, that this would solve. But also, I just kind of want to see if you can really make moving between the two systems seamless and not involving a trusted third party. Like, what does that really do to the usage of that? Like how many people actually would use a tool for that to swap over into Monero to do something they don't trust the privacy property of Bitcoins on? Um, and like, really, how would that play out? Like, how would that affect Monero's long-term scalability, like the, the operational cost to run a node? Like, you know, how, how really, how long is it viable for that kind of bridge to exist and allow people to use stronger privacy in something like Monero. Yeah, and uh, I didn't fully read the details that they've published on GitHub, but in the Reddit post alone, he was talking about like a maker-taker situation. So it's, yeah, I guess that's the kind of scenario that they're seeing in terms of how people actually conduct the swap. Um but yeah, I mean, the reason I'm interested is just because, like, I'm not, I like, I don't believe in the long-term viability of Monero as it currently is. And, and like you said, it's getting listed from exchanges, which is not a big deal to me because I don't even use exchanges. But um, if Monero is going to get more adoption, I am I think it would be easier for them to get adoption by being like a kind of you know, almost like a privacy layer for Bitcoin until Bitcoin gets more privacy, which is how I've always kind of seen Monero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can definitely agree with that. Especially if uh, we're going to be able to do ring signatures in a very rudimentary way with uh, Taproot. Hmm. You just kicked off a whole chain of dominoes in my head about trying to arrange a swap through a Wabi Sabi coin join so that mm. the sender of the Bitcoin doesn't see where he sent that Bitcoin to get Monero from somebody. Mm. Interesting thing to think about. All right, so yeah got another piece of news involving Monero. So, um, Who names White their House. dart and mark at White House? <laughs> Seriously. Trolls. Literally the whitest White House. Well, I guess, I guess it's currently orange more than white, but you know. But, Is that um, some kind of like marketing thing? Like, we're not a dark market, we're a white market. I think it's probably just trolling Trump and the White House um, and their inability to make dark markets go away even though they keep busting them. I see. But, um, yeah. 
uh, White House market no longer supports Bitcoin and are only using Monero. And um, this was something they were kind of planning on um, doing eventually in terms of transitioning. But I do have... Um, some issues so the reason this accelerated is because they were using a exchange api um to swap coins it looks like and that exchange started blocking um access from tor exit nodes um yeah so that's just kind of odd don't you think yeah um so that brings up in my mind a whole lot of questions about how competent the security of this market is um on every level and what the hell somebody's thinking using a third-party swap API um, directly hooked into an illegal marketplace. Uh, and I, I would like to remind people that um, when you buy things on a darknet market, um, you, can, you can say that your transaction's anonymous because you're using Monero, but you still have to cough up a physical address to whoever you're buying stuff from to receive whatever you're buying. So, so yeah, um, obligatory warning. Um, people buying things on darknet markets are morons, in my opinion. Um, there is metadata all over the place that can get you caught up. Um, have fun being stupid at your own risk. But that aside... Um, I find it really weird how a lot of these darknet markets are not looking into the Lightning Network. Um, like that really offers so many ways to obscure things. Like you, you just run a node over Tor. Um, sourcing liquidity is getting easier and easier these days. And then nowadays you don't even have to you know, just close that channel and have um, UTXOs people know belong to a darknet market, you can do things like just loop them out through a loop out server. So, yeah, um, it, it really kind of doesn't make sense to me, the thinking of marketplaces who are planning to swap over to Monero like this um, to accept the lower liquidity so on and so forth whereas they could have a much more liquid and valuable thing and still break chain analysis in the sense that you can't tie specific utxos to market activity anymore but yeah if you mm -hmm. insist on being dumb i guess fine but i'm mostly just going to be watching back and seeing how big of a trend this becomes and if so how that really plays out well uh to kind of transition to the next story if you're going to buy something off of a dark market you should probably have an address to give them that's not actually where you live indeedly do so this not strictly uh related to bitcoin or crypto at all um I just stumbled upon this over the week and I had to talk about it because this is cool as shit and a stepping stone to something cypherpunks have talked about for a long, long time. Uh, so there is this company in Japan called uh, Mercari, um, founded in 2013, and it's pretty much just like a... a mobile application um, and it was the first um, mobile app in japan at the time for this kind of thing that allows people to just buy and sell um all kinds of random crap kind of like ebay or um craigslist and so on 
And it really kind of exploded just because it was a lot easier, um, you know, being the first mobile application in Japan like this, but also um, just apparently like a, a big cultural dynamic um, kind of kicked in here and people started selling like very, very low value, like random stuff which they did not on the like desktop uh, web versions of, of these types of marketplaces. And so it kind of had a unique niche where people were listing and selling things that all of the other markets weren't. Um, but they really kind of expanded and did pretty well just guaranteeing um, escrow for the receipt of things so people couldn't get uh, ripped off and then kind of policing um, weirder illegal things on the marketplace. And um, one of the key things, though, of this app was that you could buy things anonymously um, because Japan is a, a very privacy-conscious society. And a program that they actually, um, this company negotiated with the Japanese Postal Service um, specifically to maintain that privacy is pretty much a double blinded shipping system, or as I would put it, a one hop, um, kind of onion routing where the receiver of a good, instead of having their address on the package, just has an anonymous pointer or, or a way to find that person's address that the post office has. And the same goes for the return address of the person um, sending the item. So pretty much both people involved in the transaction um, have no clue um, what the address of the person on the other end is. So you would just kind of send this to your post office, and that's as much information as the sender would get about you. And from there, the post office can scan the pointer, find your actual address, and forward it to you. And in the event of needing to return something, um, the same thing. Um, the buyer would just send it back to the sender's, or the original sender's, um, post office, scan the pointer, and then route the last hop to the person it's being returned to. And this whole system um, kind of preserves um, you know, privacy to a degree that uh, I'm not aware of existing anywhere else in the world, um, aside from places where you know, maybe way in the middle of nowhere, you just show up at the post office and go, do you have anything for me? And th this is kind of like this instantly reminded me of the idea of onion routed um, mail services, which is something like kind of, um, you know, a mix net for physical packages, which is something mm -hmm. cypherpunks have talked about forever. And while this is nowhere near like a, a multi hop obscuring, you know, potentially even what country you're in type thing, you know, th this is like a first baby step towards building things like that and it, it just blows my mind that this actually exists in japan right now yep i want me some of this americans it's time to act more japanese that is all all right and i guess last thing for me today um Jack Maulers is just kicking the living shit out of things. So Lightning Strike has launched a new payday feature where you can set up um, pretty much receiving percentages of your paycheck um, immediately in Bitcoin. And the first person I'm aware of using this is Russell Okung, the NFL player um, who has become a pretty uh, energetic Bitcoin evangelist over the last year or so um, is going to be receiving, I, I think, I'm sorry for all the sports fans I'm pissing off right now, um, I think it was like 25% of his salary is going to be received in Bitcoin over strike um, starting 2021. Not half? So, I think it was um, half. It, 
it might have been half. I don't know. I'm sorry. I hate sports. I don't. I don't pay attention to sports stuff. I, I don't know. <laughs> Same. But um, yeah. Um, this is like getting bonkers at this point. I mean, like strike began as just a way for you to spend Bitcoin without capital gains. Um, then it became a way to receive Bitcoin as dollars. Um, and then, you know, probably sometime before, um, people figured out this is an easy way to buy and sell Bitcoin. I can just send it to myself on strike and sell it, or I can just send to myself from strike and buy it. So it, it's, it's like, uh, at the, you know, it's a, a payment app a uh, merchant processing tool it's an on and off ramp now it's a way to acquire your um your freaking paycheck to whatever percentage you want in bitcoin automatically directly and not just a conventional um on and off ramp i mean it's like th this is just getting bonkers i mean like i i, I am really starting to think that the entire game plan in Jack's head is just keep building out more and more financial services like this and essentially just to build all of that on top of what is going to become a Bitcoin clearinghouse. Like, I, I think he, he is really just going for the jugular in terms of attracting massive fiat and Bitcoin liquidity. And just being a central clearinghouse for all these different, um, you know, types of services being built into Strike. You know what I mean? Mm hmm And, like, if he can pull that off, I mean, like, Jesus. I could see Strike, you know, like, most people think about Strike as, like, competing with things like Cash App. Um if Jack can pull something like that off, um, you're going to be talking about strike in five years in terms of competing with Coinbase. I mean, I think it's already competing with Coinbase. I, I mean, in terms of, of size and scale and like massive liquidity going on there, not just people buying and selling retail level things. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Jack is a ballsy, crazy motherfucker, and personally, I hope he pulls that off if I have that right. Yeah, I mean, um, I think it's really cool, and for, uh, you know, normie people, uh, the normie-leaning crowd of Bitcoin who still has, you know, normie jobs and stuff like that, um, I think this is a great option. And, I mean, if you have to pick your uh, KYC uh, intermediary, I guess Strike is a pretty good option compared to a lot of the other people in the space. Um, just keep in mind that, uh, yeah, unfortunately your, your uh, information gets, you know, churned through the uh, Plaid machine and Plaid is still getting subjected to a class action lawsuit because they basically uh, want to suck up all of the financial data of everyone everywhere. Yeah, but I mean, there's not much that can be done about that um, given the fiat interfaces. But, you know, I think it's, it's not even just normies this is good for. I mean, anybody who is interacting in some way with KYC stuff and not trying to pull everything completely off grid and never touch any of those entities. Like this, I think is really going to build out into a crazy massive service. I mean, I, I, I'm already at the point where, um, when they launch their debit card, um, fuck cash app. Um, I trust Jack Mahler's a lot more than I trust Jack Dorsey. Yeah. And I mean, if, uh, if you're going to, if you're going to choose um, a trusted third party, you might as well choose one where you get to avoid paying a bunch of tax on all of your, all of your coin movements. I mean, not necessarily. If I spend Bitcoin to myself and then spend cash, I, that that's on me to, yeah, to go tell not... the IRS to not get in trouble. 
Yeah, it's not tax free, but the whole point of it was, you know, for a certain use case to avoid uh technically you know that well i just like the idea that it's seamless has lightning on chain support um i immediately have a fiat balance so anything i send is a discrete thing i don't have to worry about it beyond that but also i would be able to from a single account um use a visa card connected to that presumably pull cash out or send off bitcoin um, on chain or through the lightning network to any merchant accepting bitcoin so it's just like you, you know what i mean the, the, the flexibility there is just stupid if you are already using kyc services like that like i have less of a headache to deal with I can do anything I need to in dollars, but anybody who would rather take Bitcoin from me rather than dollars, that it's all just the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the, this payday thing almost, almost makes me want to get a job. Almost? Almost. Alrighty, though. So, what cool thing was recreated digitally, and pretty well, I might add. Well, uh, we were all pretty sad uh, last couple of months because uh, the faint, most famous Bitcoin bar, Room 77, in Berlin um, had to close related to COVID in part, but also a number of other reasons which haven't really been discussed anywhere but uh yes very sad although there has been talk that so many people were upset about the bar potentially closing that it's probably going to reopen at some point in a few years who knows um lots of details to be worked out there but if you uh, are really missing it and still want to enjoy some semblance of a uh physical space in a way uh, or at least the aesthetics of room 77 which were pretty cool um someone uh from the community there has recreated uh room 77 for rc3 the chaos communication congress this year and it is accessible via the pixel world that was set up to uh facilitate you know remote meetups and all of that so you can actually go into room 77 and it automatically joins you to a Jitsi room when you walk to a certain place in the room. Um, also with RC3, you can just walk up to individual people and connect to them, but um, the Jitsi is for bigger crowds. Um, so yeah, you can walk around, you can see some posters that are literally recreated uh, pictures that were actually taken from room 77 including a banner or two banners actually and the furniture and the colors are pretty pretty damn close um unfortunately i have uh, given away all of the tickets that i acquired so i can't give any to the audience if you want to see it yourself but i'm sure uh i'm sure there's enough interest that someone will want to keep hosting that room somehow after the conference at least i hope that's what happens so that other people can join it because despite the fact that room 77 the bar has been closed the meetup that has has been happening there every thursday ish uh for 10 years now um that has still been going on that never stopped even when the bar closed so and that's been happening over jitsi so I'm sure there's going to be people who want to have also the room to walk ar around in as a pixel person. When VR version? Yeah, um, this is yeah, this is separate from that. I'm not sure what is happening with the VR version. I haven't seen an update about that, but this is a pretty good substitute for now. But 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 VR. VR. VR, VR. Alrighty. Well, we are going to slide into final thoughts times now because 
When this is done, Ginny needs to show me around the virtual room 77. Yes. Um, final thought is there's been a lot of great uh, talks that have been given at RC3. Um, the most popular one, surprisingly, um, not or maybe not surprisingly, is the one given by Andy Mueller Magoon, who's, um, I mean, he's closely associated with the Chaos Computer Club, so it's not surprising that he had a popular talk because a lot of people know him, but he's also part of the Val Holland Foundation, which has been accepting fiat donations for WikiLeaks for a very long time, and so he's very familiar with their situation in the Assange case. And he gave a talk last year about the surveillance and espionage that was happening at the Ecuadorian embassy in connection to UC Global and the CIA. This year, he gave a talk about how he believes he's been personally targeted by possibly the same organizations um, due to his connection to the case. And it is currently the most viewed talk, um, the most recorded talk, uh, according to the media hub that CCC runs for all of their talks that are available from their events, with over 35,000 views. So... That's pretty great. There's a bunch of other ones that, um, I mean, most people who attend CCC know that you attend the conference to meet people and then you watch the talks later because CCC does such a great job of live streaming and just making all of the talks available in a really high quality format. So I haven't seen all of them, but definitely check that out at media.ccc.de if you want to see. It's one of the biggest and most popular conferences in the world. Um, and, and, well, since this is going to probably be the last episode that we do before, uh, the big day, uh, on January 4th, we are supposed to hear about, uh, what the judge in the UK has decided regarding Julian Assange's extradition. Um, so that is going to be a big day. Uh, we're going to find out whether, I mean, basically it's been pre-decided that if it gets approved, there's going to be an appeal. So nothing majorly significant is going to happen on that day um, outside of him not getting extradited and being released from Belmarsh. Um, the other option is that there's an appeal that gets filed and he's stuck in the UK for another at least a year or so. Yeah. Hopefully that does not happen. Well, I guess, um, yeah, my only final thought is Mercari onion routing for mail. America. Make America Japan again. Yeah, whatever you do, uh, don't call it a uh, harbor anything. Japan Harbor. Catch you later, punks. Just trying to make a safe harbor joke there. Oh. Well, that went over my head.